Welcome to my channel. Tonight's story is A Neighbor's Landmark by M. R. James. Those who spend the greater part of their time in reading or writing books are, of course, apt to take rather particular notice of accumulations of books when they come across them. They will not pass a stall, a shop, or even a bedroom shelf without reading some title. And if they find themselves in an unfamiliar library, no host need trouble himself further about their entertainment. The putting dispersed sets of volumes together, or the turning right way up of those which a dusting housemaid has left in an apoplectic condition, appeals to them as one of the lesser works of mercy. Happy in these employments, and occasionally opening an 18th century octavo to see what it is all about, and to conclude after five minutes that it deserves the seclusion it now enjoys, I had reached the middle of a west, wet August afternoon at Betton Court. You begin in a deeply Victorian manner, I said. Is this to continue? Remember, if you please, said my friend, looking at me over his spectacles, that I am a Victorian by birth and education, and that the Victorian tree may not unreasonably be expected to bear Victorian fruit. Further, remember that an immense quantity of clever and thoughtful rubbish is now being written about the Victorian age. Now, he went on, laying his papers on his knee, that article, The Stricken Years, in the Times Literary Supplement the other day, Abel? Of course it is Abel. But, oh, my body and soul, do just hand it over here, will you? It's on the table by you. I thought you were to read me something you had written. I said, without moving. But, of course... Yes, I know, he said. Very well, then, I'll do that first. But I should like to show you afterwards what I mean. However, he lifted the sheets of the paper and adjusted his spectacles. At Betton Court, where, generations back, two country house libraries had been fused together, and no descendant of either stock had ever faced the task of picking them over or getting rid of duplicates. Now, I am not setting out to tell of rarities I may have discovered, of Shakespearean quartos bound up in the volumes of political tracts, or anything of that kind, but of an experience which befell me in the course of my search, an experience which I cannot further explain away or fit into some scheme of my ordinary life. It was, I said, a wet August afternoon, rather windy, rather warm. Outside the window, great trees were stirring and weeping. Between them were stretches of green and yellow country, for the court stands high on a hillside, and blue far hills far off, veiled with rain. Up above was a very restless and hopeless movement of low clouds traveling northwest. I had suspended my work, if you can call it work, for some minutes to stand at the window and look at these things, and at the greenhouse roof on the right with the water sliding off it, and the church tower that rose behind it. It was all in favor of my going steadily on, no likelihood of a clearing up for hours to come. I, therefore, returned to the shelves, lifted out a set of eight or nine volumes, lettered tracts, and conveyed them to the table for closer examination. They were for the most part from the reign of Anne, there was a good deal of the late peace, the late war, the conduct of the Allies. There were also letters to a convocation man, servants preached at St. Michael's, Queen Hith, inquiries into a late charge of the Reverend Lord Bishop of Winchester, or more probably Winton, to his clergy, things all very lively once, and indeed still keeping so much of their old sting that I was tempted to betake myself into an armchair by the window, and give them more time than I had intended. Besides, I was somewhat tired by the day. The church clock struck four, and it really was four, for in 1889 there was no saving of daylight. So I settled myself, and first I glanced over some of the war pamphlets, and pleased myself by trying to pick out Swift by his style among the undistinguished. But the war pamphlets needed more knowledge of the geography of the Low Countries than I had. I turned to the church and read several pages of what Dean of Canterbury said to the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge on the occasion of their anniversary meeting in 1711. 
when I turned over to a letter from the beneficed clergyman in the country of the Bishop of C, I was becoming languid, and I gazed for some moments at the following sentence without surprise. This abuse, for I think myself justifying in calling it by that name, is the one which I am persuaded your lordship would, if twere known to you, exert your utmost efforts to do away. But I am also persuaded that you know no more of its existence than, in the words of the country song, that which walks in the Betton wood knows why it walks or why it cries. Then indeed I did sit up in my chair and run my finger along the lines to make sure that I had read them right. There was no mistake. Nothing more was to be gathered from the rest of the pamphlet. The next paragraph definitely changed the subject. But I have said enough upon this topic, where it's opening words. So discreet, too, was the namelessness of the beneficed clergyman that he refrained even from initials and had his letter printed in London. The riddle was of a kind that might faintly interest anyone. To me, who have dabbled in a good deal works of folklore, it was really exciting. I was set upon solving it, on finding out, I mean, what story lay behind it, and, at least, I felt myself lucky in one point, that whereas I might have come on the paragraph in some college library far away, here I was at Betton, on the very scene of action. The church clock struck five, and a single stroke on a long gong followed. This, I knew, meant tea. I heaved myself out of the deep chair and obeyed the summons. My host and I were alone at the court. He came in soon, wet from a round of landlord's errands, and with pieces of local news which had to be passed on before I could make an opportunity of asking whether there was a particular place in the parish that was still known as Betton Wood. Betton Wood, he said, was a short mile away, just on the crest of Betton Hill, and my father stubbed up the last bit of it when it paid better to grow corn than scrub oaks. Why do you want to know about Betton Wood? Because, I said, in an old pamphlet I was reading just now, there are two lines of a country song which mention it, and they sound as if there was a story belonging to them. Someone says that someone else knows no more of whatever it may be than that which walks in Betton Wood, knows why it walks or why it cries. Goodness, said Philipson, I wonder whether that was why... I must ask old Mitchell. He muttered something else to himself, and took more tea, thoughtfully. Whether that was why, I said. Yes, I was going to say whether that was why my father had the wood stubbed up. I said just now that it was to get more plow land, but I don't really know if it was. I don't believe he ever broke it up. It's a rough pasture at this moment, but there's one old chap at least who will remember something of it, old Mitchell. He looked down at his watch. Blessed if I don't go down there and ask him. I don't think I'll take you, he went on. He's not so likely to tell anything he thinks is odd if there's a stranger by. Well, mind you remember every single thing he does tell. As for me, if it clears up, I shall go out, and if it doesn't, I shall go on with the books. It did clear up, sufficiently at least, to make me think it was worthwhile to walk up the nearest hill and look over the country. I did not know the lie of the land. It was the first visit I had paid to Philipson, and this was the first day of it. So I went down the garden and through the wet shrubberies with a very open mind, and offered no resistance to the indistinct impulse. Was it, however, so very inst indistinct? Which kept urging me to bear to the left whenever there was a forking of the path. The result was that after going ten minutes or more of dark going between dripping rows of box and laurel and privet, I was confronted by a stone arch in the Gothic style set in a stone wall which encircled the whole demise. The door was fastened by a spring lock, and I took the precaution of leaving this on the jar as I passed out into the road. That road I crossed and entered a narrow lane between hedges which led upward, and that lane I pursued at a leisurely pace for as much as half a mile, and went on to the field to which it led. I was now on a good point of vantage for taking in the situation of the court, the village, and the environment, 
and I leant upon a gate and gazed westward and downward. I think we must all know the landscapes. Are they by Burkett Foster or somewhat earlier, which, in the form of woodcuts, decorate the volumes of poetry that lay in the drawing room tables of our fathers and grandfathers? Volumes in art cloth, embossed bindings, that strikes me as being the right phase. I confess myself an admirer of them, and especially of those which show the peasant leaning over a gate in the hedge and surveying, at the bottom of a downward slope, the village church spire, embosomed amid venerable trees and a fertile plain intersected by hedgerows and bounded by a distant hills, behind which the orb of the day is sinking, or it may be rising, among the level clouds illumined by his dying or nascent ray. The expressions employed here are those which seem appropriate to the pictures I have in mind, and were there opportunity, I would try to work in the vale, the grove, the cot, and the flood. However, they are beautiful to me, these landscapes, and it was just such a one that I was now surveying. It might have come straight out of Gems of Sacred Song, selected by a lady and given as a birthday present to Eleanor Phillipson in 1852 by her attached friend, Millicent Graves. All at once I turned as if I had been stung. There thrilled into my right ear and pierced my head a note of incredible sharpness, like the shriek of a bat, only ten times intensified, the kind of thing that makes one wonder if something has not given way in one's brain. I held my breath and covered my ear and shivered. Something in the circulation, another minute or two, I thought, and I return home. But I must fix the view a little more firmly in my mind. Only, when I turned to it again, the taste was gone out of it. The sun was down behind the hill, and the light was off the fields. And when the clock bell in the church tower struck seven, I thought no longer of kind, mellow evening hours of rest, and scents of flowers and woods on the evening air, and of how someone on a farm a mile or two away would be saying, How clear Benton Bell sounds tonight after the rain! But instead, images came to me of dusty beams and creeping spiders and savage owls up in the tower, and forgotten graves and their ugly contents below, and of the flying time and all it had taken out of my life. Just then into my left ear, close as if lips had been put within an inch of my head, the frightful scream came thrilling again. There was no mistake possible now. It was from the outside. With no language but a cry was the thought that flashed into my mind. Hideous it was beyond anything I had heard of or heard since. But I could read no emotion in it and doubted if I could read any intelligence. All its effect was to take away every vestige, every possibility of enjoyment and make this no place to stay in one moment more. Of course, there was nothing to be seen, but I was convinced that if I waited, the thing would pass me again on its aimless, endless beat, and I could not bear the notion of a third repetition. I hurried back to the lane and down the hill. But when I came to the arch in the wall, I stopped. Could I be sure of my way among those dank alleys, which would be danker and darker now? No, I confessed to myself that I was afraid. So jarred were all my nerves with the cry on the hill that I really felt I could not afford to be startled even by a little bird in a bush, or a rabbit. I followed the road which followed the wall, and I was not sorry when I came to the gate in the lodge and descried Philipson coming up towards it from the direction of the village. "'And where have you been?' said he. I took that lane that goes up the hill opposite the stone arch in the wall. "'Oh, did you?' Then you've been very near where Betton Wood used to be, at least if you followed it up to the top and out into the field. And if the reader will believe it, that was the first time I put two and two together. Did I at once tell Philipson what had happened to me? I did not. I have not had other experiences of the kind which are called supernatural or normal or physical, but though I knew every, very well I must speak of this one before long, I was not at all anxious to do so and I think I have read that this is a common case. So all I said was, Did you see the old man you meant to? Old Mitchell? 
Yes, I did, and got something of the story out of him. I'll keep it till after dinner. It really is rather odd. So when we were settled in after dinner, he began to report, faithfully, as he said, the dialogue that had taken place. Mitchell was not far off eighty years old, was in his elbow chair. The married daughter with whom he lived was in and out, preparing for tea. After the usual salutations, Mitchell, I want you to tell me something about the wood. What wood's that, Master Reginald? Benton wood. Do you remember? Mitchell slowly raised his finger and pointed an accusing forefinger. It were your father done away with Benton wood, Mr. Reginald. I can only tell you that much. Well, I know it was, Mitchell. You needn't look at me as if it were my fault. Your fault? No, I says it were your father done it, before your time. Yes, and I dare you say if the truth was known, it was your father that advised him to do it, and I want to know why. Mitchell seemed a little amused. Well, he said, my father were woodman to your father and your grandfather before him, and if he didn't know what belonged to his business, he ought to done. And if he didn't give advice that way, I suppose he might have had his reasons. Mightn't he now? Of course he might, and I want you to tell me what they were. Well now, Master Reginald, whatever makes you think as I know what his reasons might have been, I don't know how many years ago. Well, to be sure, it was a long time, and you might easily have forgotten if you ever knew. I suppose the only thing for me to do is to go and ask old Ellis what he can recollect about it. That had the effect I hoped for. Old Ellis, he growled. First time I ever heard anyone say old Ellis were any use for any purpose. I should have thought you'd know better than that yourself, Master Reginald. What do you suppose old Ellis can tell you better than I can tell you about Betton Wood? And what call have he got to be put before me, I should like to know? His father warn't woodman on the place. He were plowman, and that's what he was. And so anyone could tell you what knows. Anyone could tell you that, I says. Just so, Mitchell. But if you know about Benton Wood and won't tell me, why, I must do the best I can and try and get it out of somebody else. And old Ellis has been on the place very nearly as long as you have. That he ain't. Not by 18 months. Who says I wouldn't tell you nothing about the wood? I ain't no objection. It's only a funny kind of a tale, and tain't right to my thinking it should be all about the pe- parish. You, Lizzie, do you keep in your kitchen a bit? Me and Master Reginald wants to have a word or two private. But one thing I'd like to know, Master Reginald, what came to put you upon asking about it today? Oh, well, I happened to hear of an old saying about something that walks in Benton Wood, and I wondered if it had anything to do with its being cleared away, that's all. Well, you was in the right, Master Reginald, however you come to hear of it, and I believe I can tell you the rights of it better than anyone in this parish, let alone old Ellis. You see, it came about this way, that the shortest road to Allen's farm laid through the wood, And when we was little, my poor mother, she used to go many times in the week to the farm to fetch a quart of milk, because Mr. Allen, what had the farm then under your father, he was a good man, and anyone that had a young family to bring up, he was willing to allow them so much in the week. But never you mind about that now. And my poor mother, she never liked to go through the wood, because there was a lot of talk about the place, and sayings like what you spoke about just now. But every now and then, when she happened to be late with her work, she would have to take the short road through the wood, and sure as ever she did, she'd come home in a rare state. I remember her and my father talking about it, and he'd say, well, but it can't do you no harm, Emma. And she'd say, oh, but you have an idea of it, George. Why, it went right through my head, she says, and I came over all bewildered like, and as if I didn't know where I was. You see, George, she says, it ain't as if you was about there in the dusk. You always goes there in the daytime, now don't you? And he says, why, to be sure I do. Do you take me for a fool? And so they'd go on. And time passed by, and I think it wore her out, because you understand it weren't no use to go for the milk not till the afternoon, 
and she wouldn't never send none of us children instead for fear we should get a fright. Nor she wouldn't tell us about it herself. No, she says, it's bad enough for me. I don't want no one else to go through it, nor yet hear talk about it. But one time I recollect, she says, well, first it's a rustling, like all along in the bushes, coming very quick, either towards me or after me, according to the time. And then there comes this scream as appears to pierce right through from one ear to the other. And the latter I am coming through, the more I am likely to hear it twice over. But, thanks be, I have never yet heard it the three times. And then I asked her, and I says, Why, that seems like someone walking to and fro all the time, doesn't it? And she says, Yes, it do. And whatever it is she wants, I can't think. And I says, Is it a woman, mother? And she says, Yes, I've heard it is a woman. Anyway, the end of it was my father, he spoke to your father, and told him the wood was a bad wood. There's never any bit of game in it, and there's never a bird's nest there, he says, and it ain't no matter of use to you. And after a lot of talk, your father, he came and see my mother about it, and he sees she want one of these silly women that gets nervous about nothing at all, and he made up his mind that there was something to it. And after he asked about it in the neighborhood, and I believe he made out something, and wrote it down in a paper that very much likely you've got up at the court, Master Reginald. And then he gave the order, and the wood was stubbed up. They'd done all the work in the daytime, I recollect, and it was never there after three o'clock. Didn't they find anything to explain it, Mitchell? No bones or anything of that kind? Nothing at all, Master Reginald, only the mark of a hedge and a ditch along the middle, much about where the quickset hedge, hedge run now. And with all the work they'd done, if there had been anything put the way there, they would have been bound to find them. But I don't know whether it done much good, after all. People here don't seem to like the place no better than they did afore. That's about what I got out of Mitchell, said Philipson. And as far as any explanation goes, it leaves us very much where we were. I must see if I can't find that paper. Why didn't your father ever tell you about this business, I said. He died before I went to school, you know and I imagine he didn't want to frighten us children by such a story. I can remember being shaken and slapped by my nurse for running up that lane towards the wood when we were coming back rather late one winter afternoon. But in the daytime, no one interfered with our going into the wood if we wanted to, only we never did want. Hmm, I said, and then, do you think you'll be able to find that paper your father wrote? Yes, he said, I do. I expect it's no further away than that cupboard behind you. There's a bundle or two of things specially put aside, most of which I've gone through at various times, and I know that there's one envelope labeled Betton Wood. But as there was no Betton Wood anymore, I never thought it would be worthwhile to open it, and I never have. We'll do it now, though. Before you do, I said, I was still reluctant, but I thought this was perhaps the moment for my disclosure. I'd better tell you I think Mitchell was right when he doubted it clearing away the wood put things straight. And I gave him the account you've heard already. I need not say Philipson was interested. Still there, he said? It's amazing. Look here. Will you come out there with me now and see what happens? I will do no such thing, I said. And if you knew the feeling, you'd know you'd be glad to walk ten miles in the opposite direction. Don't talk of it. Open your envelope, and let's hear what your father made out. He did so, and read me the three or four pages of jottings which it contained. At the top was written a motto from Scott's Glenfilius, which seemed to me well chosen. Where walks, they say, the shrieking ghost. Then there were notes of his talk with Mitchell's mother, from which I extract only this much. I asked her if she ever thought she saw anything to account for the sounds she heard. She told me, no more than once, on the darkest evening she ever came through the wood, and then as she seemed forced to look behind her as the rustling came in the bushes, and she thought she saw something all in tatters, with the two arms held out in front of it coming on very fast, and at that she ran for the stile, 
and tore her gown all to fenders getting over it. Then he had gone to two other people whom he found very shy of talking. They seemed to think, among other things, that it reflected discredit on the parish. However, one, Miss Emma Frost, was prevailed upon to repeat what her mother had told her. They say it was a lady of title that married twice over, and her first husband went by the name of Brown, or it might have been Brian. Yes, there were Bryans at the court before it came into our family, Philipson put in. And she removed her neighbor's nat landmark. Leastways, she took in a fair piece of the best pasture in Benton Parish that belonged by rights to two children as hadn't one sp to speak for them, and they say years after she went from bad to worse and made out false papers to gain thousands of pounds up in London. And last they were proved in law to be false, and she would have been tried and put away to death, very like, only she escaped away for the time. But one, no one can avoid the curse that's laid on them that removes the landmark. And so we take it she can't leave Betton before someone take it and put it right again. At the end of the paper there was a note to this effect. I regret that I cannot find any clue to previous owners of the fields adjoining the wood. I do not hesitate to say that if I could discover their representatives, I would do my best to indemnify them for the wrong done to them in years now long past, for it is undeniable that the wood is very curiously disturbed in the manner described by the people of the place. In my present ignorance alike of the extent of the land wrongly appropriated and of the rightful owners, I am reduced to keeping a separate note of the profits derived from this part of the estate, and my custom has been to apply the sum that would represent the annual yield of about five acres to the common benefit of the parish and to charitable uses, and I hope that those who succeed me may seem fit to continue this practice. So much for the elder Mr. Phillipson's paper. To those who, like myself, are readers of the state trials, it will have gone far to illuminate the situation. They will remember how, between the years of 1678 and 1684, the Lady Ivy, formerly Theodessa Bryan, was alternately plaintiff and defendant in a series of tries in which she was trying to establish a claim against the Dean and Chapter of St. Paul's for a considerable and very valuable tract of land in Shadwell how in the last of these trials, presided over by L.C.J. Jeffreys, it was proved up to the hilt that the deeds upon which she based her claim were forgeries executed under her orders, and how, after an information for perjury and forgery was issued against her, she disappeared completely, so completely indeed, that no expert has ever been able to tell me what became of her. Does not the story I have told suggest that she may still be heard of on the scene of one of her earlier and more successful exploits? That, said my friend, as he folded up his papers, is a very faithful record of my one extraordinary experience. And now, but I had so many questions to ask him, as for instance, whether his friend had found the proper order, owner of the land, whether he had done anything about the hedge, whether the sounds were ever heard now, what was the exact title and date of his pamphlet, etc., etc., that bedtime came and passed without his having an opportunity to revert to the literary supplement of the times. The End <laughs>